Here on the town square of our national life, we dedicate the United States Holocaust Museum and so bind one of the darkest lessons in history to the hopeful soul of America. If you don't have evidence to support the memory, the memory changes over time, it withers slowly. We have something here that is unique, that is effective. You have an unbelievable potential there. We need to be the voice the Jews didn't have, and we need to know when to use it. How can people get to such a point that they want to kill each other? How it was possible for so many people to participate. Innocent children, why were they not spared? Why did I survive? Why did people stand by and the world not come to our aid? What makes people do what they do? Can it happen again? What can I do in my life to make sure it doesn't happen again? Learning the lessons starts with asking the questions. Good evening, and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Edna Friedberg. I'm a historian here on staff, and I am delighted to be joined here to my left by Dr. Patricia Heberer Rice, the museum's senior historian. To her left is Sir Ben Kingsley, uh, who played Adolf Eichmann in the film. To Sir Ben's left, we have Oscar Isaac, uh, who portrayed Peter Malkin in the movie. And behind them, three esteemed gentlemen, uh, Chris Weitz, the director of the film, uh, Matt Orton, the screenwriter, and Lior Raz, who portrayed Isar Harrell. Please join me in giving them a round of applause for a terrific film. We'd also like to thank MGM very, very much for giving us the opportunity to screen the film here and for being our partner. Uh, it will premiere um, across the nation in theaters on, on August 29th, uh, so we hope that you will encourage uh, family and friends to go and see it and spread the word. Um, additionally, we are honored to have many Holocaust survivors with, with us in the room this evening, and we thank you very, very much, uh, honored by your presence. Adolf Eichmann was one of the most pivotal figures in the Holocaust. Uh, he was central to the deportation of at least one-fourth of the Jews, men, women, children, who were deported to their deaths at the killing centers and in killing sites across occupied Poland, occupied portions of the Soviet Union. But this film is less about that and more about how the world came to make sense of it through the audacious capture and eventual trial uh, in the state of Israel of Eichmann. The Eichmann trial in 1961 really shifted public awareness of the crime that we now call the Holocaust. That word was not as commonplace before that time, and it certainly was the moment when the voice, the faces of Holocaust survivors took center stage and captured the world's imagination in an unprecedented way. Uh, we saw this in the film, and I would like us to get a little bit of a behind the scenes glimpse of how it worked. Um, I'm also hoping that this will not just be some kind of ping pong where I'm the tether, so please talk to each other, respond. Um, but Chris and Matt, I'd like to begin with you since the film began with you before anyone was cast in it. Uh, how did you become aware of the story of Eichmann's capture? 
What motivated you to write the script? How did you hear about it? And why did you decide to place the emphasis on the hunt and the capture rather than the trial, which is much more uh, well known, I think? Yeah. I, so I actually studied the um, capture of Eichmann at university. I, I read history. Um, and so that was where I was first introduced to the story. Um, and then uh, a short while later, um, as I was becoming a screenwriter, I guess, uh, I read the autobiography of Peter Malkin. And in that story I read, uh, I read in, in, his, in his journey as someone who was caught in arrested development, someone who couldn't move on from a, a past, a loss from his past, uh, his sister Fruma. Um, and th through the capture of Eichmann, he found some kind of resolution or some kind of uh, catharsis. Uh, and that struck me when I then, as I started to research the project, uh, went out to Israel, interviewed a lot of people um, who had survived the Holocaust, who had uh, seen the trial of Eichmann. Uh, every single one of them described it as this amazing turning point, this amazing moment in their lives where they were able to sort of let go, and they were able to accept something awful that had happened and move on. And so I guess the thing that really drew me into the story was this idea of telling a large story about the formation of a country through the lens of this one man. Uh. Well, I think that part of the reason that it, in some ways it, it, it feels a, a, a bit like a genre uh, thriller um, is not just that that's a very effective way, I think, to deliver the dose of uh, very unpleasant stuff that the film deals with, um, but that uh, Matt's script uh, focused a great deal on the uh, m mentality of uh, Eichmann's pursuers uh, and, and what they were going through during that time, uh, every bit as much as it deals with um, Eichmann's identity and how they're trying to nail that down. I, I don't mean just literally his identity, but what is going on psychologically in such a man. And I think in addition to that uh, kind of internal struggle that we see and which I hope we will hear from the actors very soon about, uh, there's also how do you interpret and make dramatic something that happened in real life. Um, I know people expect Patricia and expect me to sort of pick apart what's real and what's not real, but really I'd rather kind of um, ask you, Matt, to talk a little bit about that. Um, what was your desire? How did you balance telling an accurate story with taking some artistic license if there were specific scenes you'd like to share with our audience? Sure, I mean, I'm very excited for Patricia to actually tear this apart, I can't, I can't wait. Um, you, you say that before she opens her mouth. So. <laughs> this guy's going to be like back, back in a tutorial. Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, a lot of, a surprising number of the events depicted in the film are actually accurate. Um, the, the, the biggest change that we made, I think, was to compress um, time. Uh, so Sylvia Herman and Klaus Eichmann really did meet, but they met four years prior to uh, our story. Um, similarly, Lothar Hermann really was arrested uh, under the guise of being Josef Mengele. Uh, it just happened right after uh, Eichmann was brought to Israel. Uh, so we sort of took several events that happened. Similarly, the torture and uh, killing of Graciela happened after. Uh, so we took several events uh, that happened either way before or slightly after and wove them into the narrative to give it a uh, structure and a cadence. Some of the characters were combined. This is, this is true, some of the characters were combined. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, sorry. Melanie. Melanie, yes. The uh, anesthesiologist uh, was actually a man. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and there were various sort of uh, dramatic reasons we chose to do that. Well, one was to get Melanie into the movie, I think. <laughs> um, she didn't really want to play Yoni Elian. Interestingly enough, though, Yoni Elian was very troubled by his role in the mission, and I believe he committed suicide uh, uh, down the line. That may have been some part of it, this notion that um, uh, it's part of the extraordinary kind of ethical uh, uh, dimension of this story that he felt he was violating his Hippocratic Oath even in pursuing this course of justice, which showed a tremendous amount of... Um, of uh, moral uh, backbone in, in treating uh, this man like, like a human being. One, one other thing would be worth throwing in there, uh, the amazing opportunity that the story presented was that so many of the agents uh, who, who wrote first-hand accounts uh, of this capture 
had differing versions of what happened. Um, and I think it's something that we, we touch on in the story, how people retell the past in different ways and position themselves differently depending on who they're talking to. And that presents great opportunities as a storyteller to find a way through those myriad of accounts. To me, and there, there's definitely an, 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 uh, an aspect of the film which is about the wanting to seize the narrative uh, one from the other. Um, and also the difficulty of recounting something in the past. So there, there's a, you know, when we see World War II in the movie, it's actually only through imaginings and through recorded memory, that itself which is being filtered through the perception of the person who's hearing it. Uh, and um, you may have noticed there are numerous instances in which um, there is a, a curtain uh, framing the action on one side or the other. Uh, that was on purpose to sort of give a sense that, that these characters who are trying to manipulate one another are in a sense presenting themselves as characters to each other and trying to enact a, a, a drama. So you know that in some ways if you get it in a way that makes everyone unhappy, you probably have some credibility, right? Uh, we, we aimed to make everyone unhappy if possible. I was, I was just thinking, having seen it perhaps now for the second time, that uh, without Melanie, I don't think that you would have had that, that moral focus on your motives. I can't imagine um, another character, um, perhaps a male character, having that, um, that kind of intimate relationship that would allow you to drop your guard in front of them. And, and, and she, she, she sort of probed your fallibility and your... Your, she examined your moral compass in a way that I think narratively was important. And I think that, that, that rather than being you know, the pretty French girl, mm -hmm. I think her narrative function was to be the, that searcher of truth, to, to hold the mirror up yeah, to the you mirror, and say, exactly. what are you doing? I, I thought yeah. that was a, I really think she's a great choice in the film for that, for that wonderful narrative function. Because we're all examining each other it's not, you know, I'm not, the, my character is not the only one examined. Everyone, all, all the Mossad guys are examining each other's motives. They have different levels of tolerance. They have different levels of restraint. Um, but I think the, the, the miraculous overall restraint from the state of Israel to Eichmann is absolutely remarkable. That he act, they actually got him there to speak is extraordinary. Right, instead of just summarily executing him. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to stay along those lines with the restraint, with the mirroring. Uh, Sir Ben and Oscar, if you could talk a bit about your characters, how you got into uh, that place, and also the unlikely relationship, the dynamic that starts to develop between them in that closed universe of the safe house. Well, for me, uh, those scenes are why I wanted to do the film. When I read that, uh, and then I, I read uh, Malkin's uh, autobiography, Eichmann in My Hands, uh, where he, he talks about all the, the psychological warfare that was happening um, and really the courage that it took to have that kind of emotional restraint in that situation. Um, it's just rem it's remarkable courage uh, to put his own feelings aside and to, in a way, give over himself to Eichmann, uh, and, and I remember we talked a lot about what, was, what happens in that room. Uh, it's, it's, be, it's so mysterious and strange and uncomfortable because uh, you know, he's giving Shabbat wine <laughs> to Eichmann. He's giving him cigarettes. Uh, he's, and and, and it like, you know, I love that you talk about the curtain. It, uh, uh, he's really playing the character, and at, at, at a certain point he even talks about he meant what he was doing. He meant what he was saying. It wasn't, it, at a certain point, it wasn't just a manipulative tactic. It was really staring into the, to the abyss of, of human, the human capability of, of evil and, uh, and reaching out into it. And so uh, for me, that was the most exciting thing to figure out. And of course, when, when I knew that, when we'd heard that, that Sir Ben was interested in doing it, it made it even more of an absolute thrill to figure out how we would, how we would attack those scenes. And, but we did manage to uh, tackle them, as you say, um, intuitively, because, quite frankly, Oscar and I never dissected each other's character or the scenes at great length. We arrived on Chris's amazing set, 
He gave us the perfect place to stand. He gave us the perfect physical disposition in which to uh, exchange our energies. And uh, I found uh, that w with Oscar's extraordinary warmth and ontological security as a character, that I could just play tennis with him. Um, and it was a great acting exercise because both of us are being manipulative, with great respect to what you just said. <laughs> both of us are being manipulative, and I think that that brought the very best out of us as, as performers and colleagues. The bottom line of our work is trust. And we, we shared a great trust. It was tacit, it was never discussed, but it, it was there, ever present. And, and it was Chris's working environment that made that possible. Lior, you've been sitting very patiently in the back. Uh, I would like to turn to you because even though Isar Harel is in some ways a supporting character, he plays a very important uh, voice in forming. Uh, you yourself are a former undercover agent for the IDF, and I'm curious, based on that perspective, what did you think especially of Harel's line about needing to focus on those who want to kill the Jews today rather than hunting down someone from the past? It just seemed very resonant. It's a sentence that he wrote, you know, so, and I had to say it, so, Matt, thank you. <laughs> but um, I think in those days, it was hard there in Israel, you know, the Fedayun, it was uh, a lot of terrorists and a lot of chases in the Baka and the Bika. Um, and they had to struggle in Israel those days and to have this kind of operation in Argentina, it's crazy just to go there and to bring someone in a crazy operation that nobody can imagine that can happen. For Israel, even though he was the most powerful man in Israel those days, him and Ben-Gurion, of course, he, I think he was mo more than Ben-Gurion those days because he had like the Shin Bet and the Mossad for the first time in, in Israel. It, he was the only man who, who controlled the Mossad and the Shin Bet together. He, was, he, know, he knew everything about everyone in Israel. Um, I love that character um, <laughs> that knows everything. Um, so I think um, for him, when, when he had this uh, opportunity to go there, and I think in Israel there was a few times that Israelis did this kind of thing. One, it's Antebe. And the, and, the, and the operation finale here in, in Eichmann. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, carriage, uh, car um, carriage to go there and to do amazing stuff that nobody imagined that you can do. And I think Israel had this carriage. Yeah, incredibly chutzpahdik and incredible yeah. power <laughs> concentrated in one man. Actually, I'd like to, Patricia, I've saved the best for last, right? Uh, ask if you could comment a little bit on this as well. Um, we know that at war's end, actually, Eichmann was briefly in American custody. I'm not sure if people in the audience know that. Um, and then escaped uh, to Argentina, uh, which had a history of denying extradition requests. So can you talk a bit from a broader historical perspective about why it was so significant to bring Eichmann to justice and why in Israel? Yeah, thank you. Um, First of all, as Eichmann kept saying to uh, his captors, um, he didn't make, he didn't dictate racial policy, but certainly he was a person who was a major architect in the deportation of, uh, facilitating deportations, arranging deportations of several million people. And in that, of course, he was a major perpetrator of the Holocaust. And it was very imperative to get him, even years later, uh, and to bring him to custody. There was a 1950 law uh, that allowed Israel to set up jurisdiction. You, you hear Eichmann saying, well, I should be tried before a German court, or I should be tried before a Polish court, or, or, or um, one of the victim nations. And uh, a 1950 law allowed that jurisdiction to take place so that the trial could be uh, trying one of the major perpetrators of the Holocaust uh, for crimes against not only humanity, but crimes against the Jewish people. And the trial really did a couple of really interesting things that you don't see before. First, it allows the definition of a desk murderer. We all think of the people, the guards in the concentration camps. We see the people in the killing centers with the guns. Eichmann didn't kill anyone. They tried very hard to show that he might have. He didn't kill a single person. He sat 
very clearly at his desk. The only time he was on the ground was in the spring of 1944 during the Hungarian deportations. Most of the time he was at his desk arranging this, and so the idea of this desk perpetrator was something we really hadn't thought a lot before. But the trial did other interesting things too. It um, allowed the survivors to be front and center, and that's what we haven't, we didn't see a lot about the trial, but at Nuremberg, the prosecutors, uh, whether American or international uh, allied uh, prosecutors, made the decision they were going to uh, let the Nazis' own words condemn them, and they used documents to do that. But it, uh, this trial is very different because it establishes the survivors front and center as the witnesses of the Holocaust. And as we see, and as uh, other people alluded to this evening, that was a kind of catharsis for the survivors who were then living in Israel at the time. And the other thing we've really seen at the end credits, towards almost the end of the film, we see that this was a, um, one of the first trials, the first proceedings of its kind that was televised on a worldwide stage. And so most historians agree uh, that this was a point at which the Holocaust and the events, the term, and the events of the Holocaust really become embedded in, in public consciousness. And um, that's sort of what the trial does and why it's so important. I'd like to actually turn now to questions from you, from the audience that have been passed. Uh, first one is here for Sir Ben. The person in the audience is asking, when you quote unquote became Eichmann, did you begin to see the world from his perspective? I never became Eichmann for a second. I consider myself um, a portrait artist and my subject sits in my studio over there and my canvas is here, and my paints are applied to the canvas by studying him and putting him down his lens onto his canvas. So I washed the paint off my hands, I put my brushes down, and I went home. I never became him. He, I'm sure he would have loved to have got in, but I'd never let him in. I have played men that I've loved, and it was a very, very different experience. And I, in a sense, I had to apply the same distance bordering on indifference that he applied to his victims. I did not care for him, but I got him on canvas. It's a very interesting analogy. Um, Oscar, what about you? Do you feel like you started to identify with Peter? How did you inhabit that character? Again, for me, his book was, was my Bible, so I would always go, go to that. I also uh, had recordings of, of him talking about, um, I remember particularly the section where he talked about the trains and watching him with his son watch the trains and the irony of that. Like, you like trains, don't you? You really like trains. And... Um, you know, he, and he always had a, a strange, almost absurd, not, not absurd, but like a sense of humor about it. Like, you could see the absurdity of the whole thing. Um, and always, you know, I think the fact that he was a painter uh, and he made these incredible portraits, um, he, he had that detached artist's view where he was kind of above it as well and looking at it, at the whole thing. And I think it's because of the fact that he was an artist is what allowed him to empathize the way he did with such, uh, such a figure, such a figure of such terror. Um, it was those, those impulses to think of him like, well, if, if I was him, what would I want right now? What would make me want to sign? What would make me want to do that? And to, to even allow himself to bridge that gap, I think that had a lot to do with it. So that was an interesting way in because I could relate to that. So perhaps in a way, Eichmann did not manage to get inside Sir Ben's head, but Peter was getting inside Eichmann's. That's what I hear you saying. Yeah, so. yeah I think so. Uh, a question for Lior, and I think especially because so much of the film is about the psyche of the Israeli agents, their struggle between restraint and revenge. Uh, obviously, you were raised and educated in Israel. Can you reflect a little bit about what you think the name Eichmann means in Israeli society today? Sure. Um, when I was young, I remember since I was four years old in the school, we were, every, every 
day or not every month we were talking about Eichmann. And when someone said Eichmann, everyone said like that. It was like, um, and also in Lagba Omer, when you do, you know what's Lagba Omer? You don't know that. It's a Jewish holiday that you just burn stuff, okay? Um, and Sounds fun. Yeah, it is fun. I'll invite you in LA to Lagba Omer. So there was, we had, it's a crazy thing, but as, as kids, we had like a, a Muppet of Eichmann that we were burning in Lagba Omer. We were burning his, his, uh, his, uh, his effigy, his effigy. I knew, I know Eichmann. it. I, I just wanted to know if you know the world. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so as a kid in Israel, and every Israeli, when you say Eichmann, it's like the worst. It's, it's like the worst. And when we see Eichmann in this movie, and you see the tenderness that Sir Ben have in his personality, when you see it on the screen, I believe that to Israelis, it will be a little bit hard to see that, because you feel for him and for, for, for a second, for a minute, in, 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 and for Israelis, it, I know it's going to be hard to see it. Um, but this is a good storytelling, and this is a good acting, and this is, this is how people are supposed to see a movie, a good movie. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about where was the film made? Where did you shoot? What were the locations? Mm. Um, we, it, it was shot all in Argentina. Uh, it was very important to me that we, we shoot there. Uh, I mean, in some ways, in a kind of a sacramental uh, sense of it, uh, I wanted to shoot it in Buenos Aires rather than shooting it in Budapest, where it might have been cheaper, or Montreal, also cheaper. Um, <laughs> probably better food, but um, <laughs> so we we shot uh, and some we used some of the actual locations. For instance, the Cinema York, which is in Olivos, which is a suburb in uh, in. Uh, uh, Buenos Aires is, I think, where the two of, the, of them met, Klaus and Sylvia Herman, or so they certainly frequented. Um, and um, we recreated uh, Eichmann's uh, house uh, outside of Buenos Aires because the uh, Garibaldi Street is now highly developed, um, but it looked very much like what we managed to do. David Brisbane, our production designer, was extraordinary. We even got a location that was near a, uh, a, an actual railway. Um, we shot in Bariloche, which is uh, in the center of the country, which is a kind of a, a cool uh, alpine kind of part of the country for, uh, for Poland and Austria. But it was done with a uh, multilingual crew in Argentina, uh, and, and that was it. Unfortunately, we, we didn't uh, go to Israel. I, I, I wish we had, but we tried our level best to recreate it. Um, Thanks in part to uh, Avner Abraham, our uh, Mossad correspondent, who was there to catch us every time that we messed up uh, our Hebrew lettering, which we did very often. Excellent. Um, this question, I don't know if it's for Matt or for Patricia. I guess it's for either of you. Um, wondering how you found the name and if there really was a blind German Jew in Argentina whose daughter dated the son of Eichmann you could either of you reflect on that. That, that is... Um, about whether that is true that there was a blind German Jew, if that was the way that Eichmann was, in fact, identified. That, that is absolutely the case. It sounds outrageous uh, and a fabrication uh, from a movie. But um, like many of the m most unlikely things in this story, it's absolutely true. Um, the, and Eichmann, the, no, the son, was using his real name which is kind of stunning, right? Even though Eichmann was going under a false identity, his kids kept his name, and that's why they were able to locate it. There were definitely a couple of moments during the writing of this story where you have to stop and pause and think, is anyone going to buy this? Is this? Does this work? Right. So, in fact, we know the parts that feel at all contrived, those must be the absolutely accurate truth, right? Okay. Yeah, the, yes. The, the, the worse it seems we're doing, the, the better it is, actually. Um, I, I was something, I, uh, something about names is very interesting to me in this movie. Uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, Klaus Eichmann kept his name rather than hiding it. There's a, a strange kind of subliminal desire to express pride in the family name, I think. 
Um, and I think it's also interesting that when Eichmann, uh, ex what Eichmann extracts that is most useful to him from Malkin is, uh, is his name and his sister's name, and he uses both of those things. Uh, you know, names have this kind of biblical resonance, and here they are kind of totems of power. We have time for a final question, and I think in a way it's directed to Sir Ben, and in a way to you, Chris, um, and it's about how you felt, how you approached about showing Eichmann in some ways almost in a sympathetic light, or at least, let's say, in a relatable light. I know, Sir Ben, you objected before we had a little conversation about humanizing, using that as a term. But if you could talk a little about what you hope audiences will be left with in the portrayal of this man. Well, one hopes that an audience, having seen the film, will have thoughts that they would not have had had they not seen the film. As simple as that. And I think our aspirations should be as modest as that and as open as that. We're not here to manipulate or proselytize. But I think that if we portray Adolf Eichmann as a Marvel comic monster villain, then we are letting Nazi Germany off the hook, and we are letting ourselves off the hook and history off the hook, and we are insulting the memory of the victims of the Holocaust. These people died uh, at the hands of men and women who were educated, articulate, who mobilized their army, their military, their culture, and uh, mutilated their language to their own ends. And to dehumanize them is really to let all of us off the hook and, and fictionalize something that regrettably was true. And Chris? I, I, yeah, I, uh, there, there's very little I would add to that um, because it's, it's so uh, aptly expressed, uh, except to say that um, uh, as well to, to, to uh, dehumanize uh, the Nazis is to kind of put them safely in the past. Um, and uh, as we find out to our uh, chagrin uh, every once in a while, this is a perennial topic. And unfortunately, um, uh, Nazi Germany was not unique. Um, these uh, upwellings of uh, national insanity can, can take place again and again. Yes, and I know that my colleagues and I sometimes say that we wish our work felt a little less relevant as we look around our universe. Um, but I really want to congratulate all of you on a nuanced, provocative film, very well done, and thank you for letting us show it here this evening. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful support. Thank you for the above all work. Thank you.